Um, so as far as starts, have you got it started, Farah? Absolutely. Uh, so just checking if, yes, we have the recording on. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and warm welcome from Women Heart to Heart. Uh, it gives us great pleasure to uh, welcome Karen. Karen, it's uh, really our pleasure to have you today. And as Diane have, has already shared, that it is going to be an absolute rocking uh, conversation as we, uh, a heart to heart conversation as we get into uh, exploring a little bit more about, uh, about your book. So um, maybe we can get started by sharing how you're feeling right now to, uh, to join us in this conversation. Um, I'm super excited. Everything I have a chance to talk about uh, moving from fear to love and actually mobilizing our hearts along with our heads. I'm kind of in my sweet spot. So I'm, I'm very excited even by the name of the community. I love it. So I'm all excited. Super. Good. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are now? Because, you know, you clearly were a C-suite um, executive. Um, you have a fabulous career, but you've transitioned that into something that is really for purpose, for a better term, and uh, something that will help women globally. So maybe you can share a little bit of that journey because our journeys and your book are all about transition. And I think that's gives us all inspiration. Yeah. And, and I think actually my whole, when, when you live your life, you don't see the red thread before you get maybe 55 as I am right now. So uh, it's, it's for me in a way, the red thread comes right from my dad because he was actually, they were having, my, my parents had a small farm and on that farm, he wasn't a very good farmer. So we were super poor. And in a way he had so much, he was so talented, so extraordinary, gifted, but as he had state fear or exams fear, he never get, got to make an education. So he became a craftsman or a, 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 a normal shop floor worker. And as because he had that title of a shop floor worker, no one asked for his opinion. And he had so many good ideas on how to improve the company, but he had the wrong title. So I was looking at that unlocked potential throughout my whole life. So then on Sundays, what did he do? He was writing books, poems, he, were, he was painting. So he was just living a second life where he got all his and I was just thinking from the very beginning, my God, companies are completely missing out on that potential. So that was the initiator of saying, first of all, I wanted to live my potential in honoring of him, but also this about how, how fear, he didn't get any help in transitioning out of that fear. So he was stuck with it the whole life. And so I, I just, no. I said, that's not gonna, gonna, that's not gonna be my life. So then fast forward, as I end, I, uh, I became a nurse. So it is, has been a weird career, right? So I, <laughs> I, became, a, I became a nurse. And there I was, at that time, when you got HIV and AIDS, you yeah. died from it. Yeah. Very, very fast often because there was no cure. And there I was meeting patients I was meeting a young guy who was 21 years old, like I was. So we were at the same age and he hadn't told his parent that he was actually gay. So now he got the diagnosis age. So he needs in a very few months need to come together with his family and actually explain how all this was going on for him and then actually say goodbye to his parent. And the way he died with grace was just, amazing. There was another woman, she was 32. She got HIV through a blood transfusion. So you could be, you could say, and, and had to die from his two, uh, uh, from her two children. She got the blood transfusion when she gave birth to her second child. 
And so that is un not understandable that you have to say goodbye to your children. But in the, here comes then the story. She, she, she could have chosen to sit in frustration, regrets, anger, pointing fingers, blaming, but she chose to move into love and actually focused on, you know, writing love letters to her children. He, she mm -hmm. celebrated that uh, her husband didn't get the disease or uh, so, and for me, this was just the ultimate grace. So that gave, gave me the second example of, I had elderly people dying with regrets and then I had young people dying with grace. And what was the difference? That was really whether they were stuck in fear or emerged into love. It was so clear that actually, so that became kind of the initiation of how do we make sure that we're not just surviving, but actually becoming fully alive? Right. And I, I, I think one of, if I can just jump in here, I think the two words, grace and love. And um, the ability to live our life with grace and honestly, and, and how love, love is part of that. There, there is no doubt about it. Um, but we talk about being heart-centered and coming from a place of love. And that can be difficult for a lot of organizations and people to understand. We understand that innately as women, um, we're all on this journey, which is why we're part of this community. So how do you translate that and help these organizations or people see how they can really have that in their life, whether it's work, whether it's business, you know what? I'm a woman the same age as you on this, the next chapter. And that's what, that's my purpose. That's my goal. But how, how do we instill that? How do you propose that we instill that into organizations? By speaking openly about it. In my last job, I was, so now we really move fast forward 30 years into my last job as a chief people office for a, uh, Nordic Bank of 30,000 people. Uh, it was the first time they ever had uh, a chief people officer. And the first time they invited a chief people officer into the executive committee. So they were kind of asking, what kind of questions would you ask if you were in a meeting? That's the starting point. So 14 days into my uh, time with them, I basically presented for the first time what I thought the company should do, the bank should do. And the title was, was, what's love got to do with it? And there were people in that room, the executive committee that had been part of interviewing me. And there were people saying they're crazy. What have we done? I mean, this is, how's this gonna work? But two and a half hours after they signed up for the journey of going with love first, because it is very simple. If you think about it, would anyone want anything else from a company than love. Customers, they want you to feel seen, heard, needed, taken care of. They want to put the company, they expect the company to put love into the product and see the needs of the, of the customers. We, uh, as employees in our organization, we want the company to make us feel safe, to grow and to enjoy. No one is in the market to buy fear. So it is absurd that that is what is radiating through companies. And then, the, then you use the argument because of course you need to talk to the intellect as well. And you argue the fact that, okay, when we are in fear, our brain is reduced, our capacity is reduced by at least 30%. Okay, that's a life hack. Don't you want access to those 30% more capacity by entering love? I think it's a beautiful business argument for actually just saying, hey, the world is full of complex problems and that cannot be solved via a mind of, via a mind of fear. So it's a complete paradox. And then, I and, and then that in that session that day, people were shit scared of love. So 
love in a way in business context create fear. That's another paradox. We are all longing, looking for it, but it's so, because we look at power and love and we say, oh, love must be for softies. So vulnerable is weak, but it's not true. Uh, and then we think, oh, but love is something that has to do with romance. But you are a courage catalyst. Courage means heart, right? So it's not at all about being soft. It's about being exactly what is needed. That's what love means, that you do what is needed, which is sometimes super tough love. Yeah, I, I actually love that you say that love is not soft because love is, love is tough. Love is... Love is strong. It, it's the strongest emotion that we have other than the opposite, fear. Yes. And um, I've never heard that 30%, you're, you're incapacitated by 30%. It's your strings. I, I think that's a starter for many organizations. <laughs> you want to get 30% more productivity? That's amazing. Yes, but that's what we do. Since Ford created the little famous car. We have basically optimized on strategies, on processes, on structures, on all the technical dimensions, but we haven't optimized on the inner operating model. And there lies so much waste. Waste in the terms that I think, oh, can I speak up? I wonder whether they want to listen to me. Do I dare to walk this path? Do I need to pick this one up? Is that really... Is that my responsibility? All the cautious thoughts that is bringing us nowhere, nowhere. Thank you, thank you, Karen. I'm just, I'm just amazed because uh, uh, at present I'm going through a really interesting uh, program on positive psychology, which talks about something similar, which is all about shifting your attention from, as you said, moving away from all these. Um, um, the, you know, things like fear, et cetera, and moving into abundance or love. And I find that it is really a huge mindset shift. And it, it takes, a, I mean, for you to have actually got this, the entire bank to listen to you in that short conversation, to move into focusing into love must have been really incredible because, you know, everybody has these big things about uh, something like this. Um, uh, yeah, so many barriers, you know, all our saboteurs come in the way of, uh, you know, how we think about these things. So I'm really curious about how you shifted that focus. I mean, while that conversation may have been really impactful at that time, how was that journey for you? But it, see, uh, I just had the first conversation and then I trusted the process because the whole idea about love is to actually, as you say, to move into abundance. So instead of me showing up with all the answers, I basically said to the executive team, how about us going out and listen to the organization and say, well, and ask them what they need. What are they longing for? What are they looking for? What would they love to do? So we went out and we asked 7,000 people of the 30,000 and they came back and they actually said, we want a new purpose for the bank. And this is the purpose we would like to see. So via a bottom-up approach where management were not involved, marketing was not involved, it wasn't a branding exercise. We asked the people, what do you want this company to be? What's the identity? And they created this beautiful, beautiful purpose. Then they went into the executive committee and they presented it. And then one of the big boys, one of the C-suite was standing there with, a, with his pen and he was almost wanting to make a little change in the purpose. But then he put the pen down and he says, this is the soul of our company. This is the soul of our people. It's perfect. And as you can imagine, such a story that changes everything that turns viral. So the people also decided that the icon for the transformation that we embarked on, which was a huge cultural transformation as an enabler for a business transformation was a big, big vibrating heart. So everyone were stickers with a heart. We talked love, <laughs> yeah. And you could say in a bank, really? Yeah. <laughs> 
But, and so for me after that, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't even my journey any longer. I was just facilitating. I was just holding the space. I was just inviting for the highest intention. We dare go with our heart. We dare listening to our customers. We are treating them as human beings, not as a wallet or an object. So how can we, how can we show our clients that we deeply care for them? That's a different conversation than a product pitch. Very different, very different. Did, did this experience lead you to write the book and the various um, courses you have within the book? Or had you written the book before this? What, no. what was the... No, I was about to start my own company uh, before being approached by this bank. Uh, and I was like, I wanted to do, I, already there I had the idea about, my company is called Breathing Business. And I, when we go to our heart, we can actually breathe. And I think companies deserve to breathe. So as I was establishing this company and then the bank said, can you please come and help us with this transformation? I, I couldn't say no to that. But then as I, as I entered, I said on one condition, and that is that we, everything we learn from this transformation, we give to the world. So we will document it and we will share ups and downs and everything super transparent. And the CEO who had been a total Goldman Sachs partner and has just been super successful, he was, yeah, yes, he said, I'm also tired of being a classical CEO. I want to contribute to the world. So in a way, it was all already lined up. So I was taking notes over under the process, but I had been leading business transformation and human transformation for 20 years. So when I stepped out of Nodea, it was natural for me to grab my pen and write the book. So the book talks about, you know, the, the essence of the book is really that 70% of all transformations fails because we are underestimating the human dimension in transformations. So here I'm, I'm actually contributing into, with the book in saying, okay, this elephant, we call a transformation. How can we how can we actually embrace that in steps? And so the book has 10 steps of transformation that outlines a path for how to transform with ease. It, it, the, the, just yes. really quickly, the thing I love hearing about this is, this is a, such an incredible example of finding your path, trusting that path, because not only were you helping transform others, but you were being transformed during the process. And it was like this beautiful synergy coming together of this is your life's work, your purpose. And it was like the universe was just laying it out for you, <laughs> giving you those options. I, I just had to jump in and say that because yes. I, I think it gives our ladies, our, our members, um, this beautiful inspirational example of how when we follow with pure passion and heart in a true, a true way, um, that it, it unfolds before you. I, I just had to, yeah. I think it's a beautiful story. And um, I, I see you have um, ways that you explained of the, the profound practices. You kind of broke them into three to simplify, um, maybe you could share that with us in a in conjunction to Farah. Sorry, interrupted there, but um, I want to ask first. I, I I will definitely come back to that one. I just want to make sure that. Do you want to say something now, or yes, I wanted to say something. I was uh, just adding to what Diane said. I'm listening to it, and I wanted to share that today was a very. Um, um, what I say, pivotal day for me, because I'm part of an association called International Association of Facilitators. And we had, every year we have, um, we celebrate the power of uh, facilitation, the kind of impact we have. Mm -hmm. And today was the FIA Awards. And it was the first time we had these virtual awards. And we had 17 uh, organizations from all over the world who, um, who, 
really surprised at with the amazing transformation they've had with facilitation. And I'm just listening to your story of what you've achieved in the bank. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is truly the power of facilitation. As you said, you just facilitated and you trust in the wisdom of the people to take this, uh, what you spoke about and the process. And that's how it transformed the whole so I'm, I, I have a feeling that you may be getting a FIA <laughs> very soon for this. And I would reach out to you to get that information. And today is really about getting to know, as Diane said, uh, what is that, you know, the heart and soul of what you've done. And, you know, to help us understand, because I think all of us in our community are all trying to uh, bring that to our workspaces. And as women, we do want to see how uh, we can dig into and lean into um, uh, the work that you do. So please, would be great to hear, you know, some of this uh, magical way in which you created those steps and transformed. Yes. Uh, so, the, so the book outlines these 10 uh, steps. Um, and for me, it is very important that you don't have to read to the end of the book, and then you get the big aha. So I really created an opportunity for to grow by each of the steps. So each of the steps has something that stimulates the brain, the head, there are statistics, there are research, there are the 30% and other ton of research that stimulates that. And so you feel calm. Okay, it's, it's okay. So then there are great, great stories that takes you into the heart stories like what I told about the 32 year old and, and people that have impacted my life. And I wanna share those story. I'm also sharing many of my own transformational stories because you don't have one transformational story. I have like at <laughs> least 50. Um, and then lastly, but most importantly, maybe what is often missed is in each of the steps, there's also something for the hands. So I have in each of the steps signature practices. So small practices, you can do five to 10 minutes per day that helps your brain rewire. Because I mean, no one transforms by being told you need to be different. That's not how it happens. It happens inside out. And for some people, transformation can work just by reading an information card or actually reading a spiritual text, meditating, but for many of us, it doesn't work like that. We need to practice, 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 small step at a time. So therefore the book is full of small practices that you can implement with your team or with your family. I usually recommend many of these to actually do with families. It's fantastic what, for instance, one of the practices in step two is about check-in. So at the family table, actually, instead of just chit-chatting or when the kids are looking at the phone, they are typically looking at the phone because you're not present. So how can you show up with a greater level of presence? And what questions can you ask them to actually show that you care deeply about what they have to share? So they are practice around how can you actually, as a mom and dad, mobilize your heart? Because when you do, your kids will too. Yes. And definitely my rule is there are no phones allowed at the table. No, yeah, but you I, can still be mentally disengaged, right? You can right. eat your food, drink up, take your pla plate and all that is just non-hardy conversation, right? Um, I think it comes down to one of those key words, time. Yes. We need to give each other time and a couple of other things you said, um, listen. Mm -hmm. Listen is a skill that we really need yes. to endorse and practice. Um, and I do, I do love the philosophy and, and believe very strongly in practice. Yes. Practice is something that um, in our high speed world, people lose sight of. And I, I think it's one of those skills that we need to ensure that we use. You cannot go out and run 12 kilometers. So you can also not just go in and fully mobilize your heart just in, it takes training. It simply is a practice like running. The more you mobilize your heart, the easier it opens. It's a simple practice. 
but it's a tough practice because the world is full of fear. So there are so many people that will keep you, move you back into drama, back into, you know, defending, pretending, diminishing, diluting, uh, all that, all that jazz. Um, so, so are there a few, um, how do we help our ladies who are listening, watching right now? What are some simple steps we can give them to begin this practice? So you talked about that there are three dimensions that matters and maybe I right. cannot hold them because it is, it's, the book is full of paradigms and the world is full of paradigms. But one of the paradigms is we think we need to work hard to show ourselves, and we think that performance comes through working long hours and you know exceeding expectation and all of that. But actually, when we are connecting, Diane, to what you said before, when you are connected to your passion and you're doing what you love doing, and you combine it with how you contribute to others, you actually achieve much greater meaning. And that's what's called P square. This means that you will be typically among the top 20% performing just by being really firm on what is it that I love doing and I contribute that with how I contribute to others. That is an amazing insight. So all you need to ask yourself is not what am I going to do, but much rather why am I going to do. So the whole, per we talk so much about purpose and in these COVID times, actually coming back to why am I here now and why does it matter to me and why would it matter to others? I think women, heart to heart women has a great opportunity to stimulate much more why and always, always start with the why. Do not start with what. You're gonna waste so much time because you're gonna bulldoze out there and just fix a lot of things. But you, why is an aligner, is a stabilizer, is a grounding element. It is a different source. So that's where the journey starts. I, I love this and I'll share this personal experience. Um, when I was, because as you, as many of the women here, my career, my passion, my path has changed many times. There's been many transformations. And I'm a creative and an ideologist as I like to call myself. So I had like five ideas bouncing around. And my daughter, it was the beginning of last year, sat down with me, my 26 year old at the time and said, mom, why? Just answer this one question. This is beautiful synergy and we get this all the time in women heart to heart don't we Farah? I know. Um, why why is it you want to do this mom and then there is actually a book called why um i can't remember the name of the author right now but i can grab it before the end or put it in the group but i just had to sit down quietly and keep asking why why do i want to do this why can i do this and you know what will that mean and i wholeheartedly believe that when we put our purpose with our passion but passion first and why it's important to us why we're the person that we do come up with incredible answers and things unfold things happen that we have a plan we can't see but they happen because when we are in y zone our energy release is so different because we are on point. We are on purpose. So in this bank, they were not in doubt that I was on fire, but not a pushy fire like, oh, we need to bring out love. No, that's not how it worked. I was just radiating that I thought this was super important for me. And if people would join me, I would be super happy. And so I think that's the first one. That's really why before anything else. Thanks, Karen. I think that's just uh, brilliant. I want to welcome uh, Ali Reza and also invite Rita and Angela, if you have anything to ask or um, share, uh, since you've been part of the conversation already, please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, welcome. of course. Yeah, hi, sorry, I was a little bit late. And uh, 
Yeah, I was really amazed by the the, the conversation because uh, actually this is one of my uh, dream in my life to work in an environment which people are working for a purpose. Because I'm, uh, by the way, I'm a software engineer and I have been working around 20 years in different companies. And uh, actually this summer I was uh, laid off by uh, my permanent job. And uh, I really moved by that situation because that was something uh, at the end of my list, if that happens, because I had a per it was a permanent job in theory. And, uh, but when it happened, it changed a lot of things in my mind. The, the, everything, uh, I had faith. Uh, I, I lost my motivation, everything, because I found that, okay, there is a business which can change you in a matter of second. And it uh, doesn't matter who you are, what you have done, and uh, who are your colleagues? Because after uh, this happened, I think one week after when I went to the office to talk to my HR manager about the termination contract, I saw some of the managers just passed me, the CEO of the company, which we had a lot of uh, re good relationships, everything, but they just passed me like uh, they don't know me. It's, it's like, okay, you are like an object, the contract is finished and you should be terminated. And uh, that really changed my mind that what we are doing actually, because I have, you know, uh, in my life, whenever I work, I saw the job as a part of my life. I had a teacher in my university told me one time that these eight hours per day you are working is the most important part of your day. I mean, you're energetic. It's the best moment of the day and you're spending that time for the work. So it's really important to uh, think about how you're going to share this with the other people. So I really love to see it when I work in a company, I share my part of my life with them. But my challenge actually is whenever I, I'm really passionate person when I, every day I wake up, <laughs> the moment I go to the meetings, I really, I become really pissed off to see the people are just thinking about their personal life and that they don't want to get together and say, okay, we are going to f uh, smash this in two days, in three days, we work together hard. It's like everyone just think about, everyone has individual business, you know, and uh, yeah, that's why I'm really interested to see how we can change this uh, actually culture in the companies. Of course, I don't think so if I can change it personally, but I think there should be a kind of realization in the, in the, in the company's organization uh, for that moment that that question happened. Sorry, I, I talked a lot. No, but I, I think you're saying something very important. Many of us feel, if I may challenge you a little bit, feel, but what can I do? I'm just one person in a company. So it's very easily to, to feel, Ugh. but in fact, any, any change starts with yourself. So just as a suggestion, having a dialogue with these people that are just looking at their own shop and treating it as their own shop, probably there is a lot of fear going on for them. So a way to just start another engagement is saying, I see that you are focusing very much on your own thing. What's going on for you? Because I would love to collaborate with you. And I want actually to create an environment where we work together. All of a sudden you have changed the conversation. And these, the fact that we, we believe we are so small, but our ripple effect is enormous, enormous. And it does not take more than 25%, 25% to change something from bad to better. So it's not like you need the whole, that you need the whole organization. 25 is still a lot, but it's not 100%. Then the minority become, becomes the majority. Yeah. But it also happens the reverse way. So you can be in a good space. And then if there are 25% that moves into fear and bullying and bashing and all of that, warm, you swing back. That's yeah, how that's adaptable, true. unfortunately, we are. And I cannot hear you. You're nodding. <laughs> So uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, oh, welcome. We have somebody else joining us. And I'm thinking about, uh, Ali, I wanted to, first of all, acknowledge you for sharing something so, uh, you know, so, so vulnerable about what you experienced in the organization. It must have been really tough for you. 
uh, but I, I, uh, Karen, I was just thinking, usually it's these things that are your tipping point or your turning point, right? You experience something and that's what spurs you into action. And that uh, turns into a really a, a gift or an opportunity to do something either, um, you know, uh, to take that passion and to take that purpose uh, to do something really brilliant. So uh, just taking off from what Ali uh, Reza asked, how do you actually create this um, it's easy to say, but I wonder what's the magic formula of creating that culture around you? I mean, we have this phrase and coming back to you, to you, Eli Reza, how do I say it? Yeah, Eli Reza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have this notion, any upset is a setup for learning. And that yeah. helps us all understand that unfortunately in life, there will, you will attract a lot of upsets. If you do something, something will happen and some people will be annoyed. But the whole point is not to see, oh no, it happens to me. Apparently when it comes to you, it is because you can handle it. So the question is not why did it happen to me, but how, what can I learn from it? What is the learning that is calling me here? And already now you have made a lot of learnings as I listen to you, you have learned that that is not you don't want to treat any person as an object. But the good thing is, the awareness is, as you see this CEO passing by and you see him treat you as an object, as you can see that, you probably also can connect that sometimes you have treated other human beings as an object because we all do it. So the learning is, I don't want to be like that. And then how can I make sure that that's, that's not what I take on? It's just as a small learning. Everything that happens to us is about us. And so when we take that home, I can give you a small example from myself. Yeah. A really shitty experience, uh, <laughs> which is always good to learn from. So <laughs> I was in another big uh, technology software company. I was a total you know, I had all the labels, high performer, top performer, blah, 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 blah. I was in all these grits you, you want to be of. And I was part of this amazing team uh, that were winning all the awards, best customer, best employee engagement, da, 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 da. And I had a wonderful, wonderful boss. Uh, then my boss got ill and he had to leave his job. And then came in a new boss. And this boss, I felt had guns in his belts. Like he, I was the chief people officer, but he started firing people. And instead of my friends that were part of this powerful team, he hired in his friends. And instead of meeting with me and discussing HR topics with me, he met with his friends. So I felt super bad. But then comes the interesting thing. Then I, then I thought I loved my job or the, how it was before. But I, within six months, I became a fraction of myself. I didn't dare to speak up. I was covering my butt. I was like, I was doing all the cautiousness until one day where I, after six months, I felt so ashamed because I were really not performing. I was really not performing. So I called his secretary and I said, can I get a meeting? And I traveled to uh, his office, which was in, an, in another country and uh, knocked on his door, came in and he said, sit down in his big office with all the, you know, all the windows, corner office. So I sat down and I said, look, I'd really, I really prepared myself. So I said, look, I, I feel really bad. I know I'm not performing in my job. I love my job and I am, I'm really afraid of you. And I just want to check if you know that I want you to be successful because I really want you to be successful. And I want to ask, do you want me to be successful? So quiet. And he said, you are afraid of me? He said, no, no. He said, I'm afraid of you. And then I realized here I was, high heels, blazer on, super chic, fast moving, high performing, all the things. He probably saw the guns in my belt. And so that was a moment where in a way we put our, down our guard and we had a really good conversation, a human to human, a heart to heart conversation around fear. 
And it was the first time that I understood that I could be a scary power woman, even though that I was scared inside. We put the back, the business had deteriorated under the, his leadership because we had all moved into fear. But now we could bring the, the, the organization back on track by actually us keeping the human connection. So that was a time when I understood, understood my, this was a massive upset for me that turned into a setup for learning. And I had not, I have not been wearing high heels and blazer since. Not that I have anything against high heels, but for me, it didn't work. I simply became, in a way I wore, I had heels on, but I was becoming much more like masculine in my approach, like da 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 da. And so for me, that's a, that was a remarkable moment where I actually understood for the first time this how much fear turns you into a fraction. And as soon as I was safe again and we were in connection, boom, I bounced back into performance and a whole different output. So it really taught me the lesson about what fear can do to you. And also all the fantasies you have when you're not checking in. That, right? Fantasies and perceptions, as you say, right? So yes. fantasies and, and I think that courageous conversation really shifted perceptions in, yes. that they probably made up. Yes. Yeah, and I think also one of the things you mentioned there um, is this mirroring. Yes. We, have, we create these mirrors and so how, which is exactly what happened with your boss. So how do we step back, recognize that? And then, which you did come from a place of heart, vulnerability, go in and address that. Because I think one of the things, and even listening to a lot of the conversations today, it's about changing those patterns and you can't change those patterns until you recognize them. And, and, and that has to be led from a place of awareness and acceptance and, um, you know, owning your part in it. Yes. And it yes. also, from the aspect of the mirroring, recognizing as a woman or a man that we do have these feminine or these masculine qualities. Yes. So how do we best balance those? Yes. So I would ask you about I just, that. Yeah, but just before, what was really important for me to understand is that I had to take ownership for what had happened. Right. And the fact that when he joined, I was mourning my old boss. I wanted my old boss back. So I didn't welcome him. I probably treated him as an object. So yes. that's the essential of the learning. I created it. And when you can take that level of ownership, you are in a transformational space. So yes. coming back to female and masculine, um, and maybe, maybe also just for this team or this community, I think it is so sad to see that we are women and we move into, for instance, an executive committee but the, uh, and as the only woman. And then we think we need to blend in and be like the rest, like the rest of the men that are there. But actually our unique contribution is that we are different. So it is so absurd in a way that we try to blend in and just accommodate or take on a blazer or speak men's talk or whatever it is, whereas it is in the mix of the female and the masculine. And I'm not talking woman, man, but much more the two right. of female, masculine energy. I have been masculine for many years before I actually dared to turn up the volume of my female dimensions. Um, but I think that's, that's really critical for women to understand what a difference we can make. If we dare being ourselves. And I, I think we have some good examples of that through COVID. If nothing else, we have some really good examples of that, of women taking on leadership roles 
and using their feminine qualities. And I, I love to hear you say it's feminine and masculine qualities, not female versus male. Because as we have come together as a community ourselves, that is the one, one of the things uh, that has distinguished us. I think that we, that we don't look at it male versus female. It's just the qualities of who we are as human beings. Um, and hopefully integrating that we have both dimensions in, in us and we can dial absolutely. it up and down. Yeah, absolutely. Karen, may I ask, I don't know if there's a question in this, but may I say something and maybe I'd like to get your thoughts. I have found, I'm also in my 50s, and I have found, and I do consulting work, and I'm, a lot of the work that I do, it seems to be, I go in initially thinking this is going to be different, or this company has different values, or this company really values my input, or really wants what I have to offer my services, and then I get in and I realize it's the same pattern. It's a challenge, it's just trying to uh, justify what I do. I get paid. There's no qualms. It's not the money or anything, but it's just the mindset. They tell you one thing, but you get in. And it just seems like a repeated pattern. And I'm just like listening to what you've said. And when you said that everything that happens to us is about us, and I'm trying to make a correlation to this. And even right now, I started a project here in Canada and it's the same old, same old. And I'm thinking, that's just what you were like, what, why? How do you, how do you make sense out of this? How does this make sense? You, I, and I would like to think that I know how to assess and, and, and pick the right, you know, but it seems like I don't know how to put it into words, but it's like, I go in thinking, okay, this is going to be different. This is going to be easy peasy. This is going to be smooth sailing, but it's the same challenges. I'm always trying to sell them on what it is we do and how we do and how we turn learning like right now it's a challenge with the learning culture in a company that's just 30 years back like they they're just somewhere in the dark ages worse than my last project at doctors without borders so what is that about like how does that what what is that about thank you rita it's a great question <laughs> you know it's a great question and the toughest part about transformation is to say again coming back to this the only one you can change, Rita, is you. And if you see the pattern coming up again and again and again, that's at least, if you, it happens once to you, you can say maybe it was an accident. But if the pattern comes back, it belongs to you. It belongs to you. So this is a tough one, but it's also a great one because when it belongs to you, you can do something about it. So what is it that in your conversation with clients makes it end there? How can you change the conversation or even speak about the fact that now here we go again, I'm ending here. So you, I'm, I'm, can I just throw in an idea? Yes, yes. That I have done is yes. saying, sometimes when I get annoyed with my clients, it's not a good idea to get annoyed with like, but sometimes you do, right? Yeah. So then I tell them, I, I, I don't think it has to do with you, but I just need to say that I'm super annoyed because I want something great out of this. And now we're sitting here having this conversation that feels very constrained. Yeah. It feels very constrained. And I know that I own this, but will you help me unfold what's actually going on? Boom. Okay. Here's another conversation. Okay. Will you help me unfold what is actually going on? That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it is like how can you pour love into the space because if in a way if you say Rita if you say they are 30 years back yes in a way a little judging yes right? See, and they feel that so they were saying aha uh -huh, she thinks that we are I mean they yeah. might not I, I don't think they feel that you say 30 years back but they know they feel maybe that you are a little elevated or a little distant and then they react with resistance. That's the only reaction they can do. Yeah, yeah. But if you instead say, hey, I don't know exactly how I can help you, but I really want to help you coming into the future. Yes, yeah. And, and a lot of the people at this project, a lot of them have been there 30, 42 years, and they just don't want to change. 
No it's wonder just, they are scared if they have been stuck in 34 years. Think about how it must be to be in their body. In one job, one company. It's, um, yeah, yeah. But I just found it, like it just triggered in my head when you said that things happen to us because it's about us. And I'm think, thinking, in, well, what about this is about me? Because I don't certainly see myself in that frame. You know, but but you're right. I gotta dig deep and find where what that is. And at least it's always a good search. If if we are thinking they are wrong, yeah, they are never wrong. And we are never wrong. It's just what is the what is the loving space where a person that has never changed for 35 years meets one that would love to help them change? Mm -hmm. How does that space look like? So I think a good question could even be to ask them, how would this make sense for you? Mm -hmm. How would this be comfortable for you? Okay. That's a very loving question. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Oh, oh yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Karen and Rita. That was brilliant. I mean, it really touched uh, touched uh, a lot of chords because I work with certain organizations that I walk in, and uh, there are a couple of organizations where uh, my coffee conversations. I'm just amazed that people have stayed in that organization for twenty odd years, and I'm I'm very curious because in that organization they love it. So, so I'm, I'm just curious, I, I, I'm just asking, so tell me, what is it about this company that makes you stay so long? Because I can't imagine having, you know, stayed for 30 odd years in one. So here you're showing a completely different perspective of, you know, an organization where probably uh, there's so much of uh, comfort in being a certain way that they haven't probably uh, embraced uh, some of these beautiful uh, aspects of love and uh, abundance that Karen is talking about. I just want to pause here and um, I'm just thinking about where we are in this conversation. And you started by this whole thing about being from the inside out. And I think that's where everything shapes. And some of the words that I wrote was how it's all about us radiating this that you said, right? And how we can create a ripple effect. And it's all about our why and purpose. So these are small things I picked up from from here and I think it's uh, uh, there's so much of learning for us and for our community as well to start thinking about it so I want to pause here because uh, I'm looking at the time and thinking that we did start a little uh, say about 10 minutes late so I wanted to take some your permission if we can guide this conversation for another five minutes would that be okay Karen and the rest of you on the group uh, mm -hmm. Ali uh, Rita yes of course that okay yeah. all right so, uh, Diane, would you like to uh, add something here? And um... Yes, thank you, Farah. Um, as we come to the close, I think one of the things that are being apparent, and I love this because I had those exact words written down, Farah, and we're always kind of like yeah. somehow in synergy, and I love that. Um, because the, the why, which I think is key, um, inside out. But I, it sounds, as we discuss this, one of the word love the word love is a word that we have to keep sharing but sharing in a way that is as you say it's not just romantic that's where people are stuck you know the hollywood movies have ruined it for all <laughs> romances and everything it's like oh my god he's gonna come running from me you know so so we have this whole perception of what love is yeah so I think it's part of the start because we're always looking, okay, how can we inspire and have some sort of impact? And part of that is by just using this word love and using it in a way that isn't scary, that is accepting of vulnerability, that love is courageous. Love is us taking our lives into our own hands and actually creating some sort of purpose, impact, passion, but recognizing that love as a driving force. So I, I think my only addition is that using the word love in a way that people can begin to relate to in business and not be fearful of and changing that language a bit. 
Yes. That would be my closing thought. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Fear contracts, love expands. Who doesn't yeah. love expansion? Yeah. And companies would love that. <laughs> Businesses would love that. Yeah. It's definitely good for business. There's no doubt about it. There's right. tons. Of, this is the, only, the other thing. There's so much research that proves that love travels much faster and much firmer and much more flowy than fear <clears throat> because you contract versus expand. So I think, I think we okay, maybe we maybe I'm just I'm just feeling it right now. You know, I'm just changing my whole energy and just yeah, no more contracting. Now it's all about abundance. Yeah. And shifting. <laughs> yeah so yeah, it's also just changing your energy. It's just changing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. But I'm very, very grateful, Karen. I think we could talk for hours and days and we hopefully will continue to. We'd love to. Because you, you are the essence of who we are and what we want to share with our whole community, this heart-centered mm -hmm. approach. It's amazing. Thank you for establishing such a beautiful community from all over the world. It's fantastic. <laughs> uh, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have this offhand, but uh, Diane, do you know uh, how many countries are uh, represented in? Uh... Oh gosh, um, I think there were like something like seventy-five. Uh, I, I want to say sixty, sixty to mm. seventy, something like that. 70 plus so yeah. if Karen you know you know who's on uh, you know we have the whole world in um, women heart to heart and I think that's what we're trying to do we want to support each other and I think as we close I wanted to ask your um, ask you what would be that one thing that you could share uh, for us as women to support each other in, in this transformation journey how can we lift each other up in, in this whole journey Never judge each other. Never judge. Always go with compassion. There's always a reason for why we act as we do. And if we are curious about that, that's the biggest help we can get. That's fantastic. I just wanted to also invite uh, Ali, Reza and Rita, if you feel like sharing on the chat or just while we close, if you have one, one key insight from this conversation, please feel free to add that. Yeah, I think uh, that was really amazing conversation. I loved it and I hope we can continue with that. What I learned and actually that's something I'm always trying to do is to try from ourselves, you know, instead of uh, looking around and uh, finding people for find the reason in other things, I think it's better to look at ourselves because we are also part of uh, this. And uh, if we can change ourselves, we can also try to change the, you know, the, the, the things around us. And yeah, I think this is what I'm going to do. And uh, every day we have another chance to do it, you know. That's it. In, yeah, incredible opportunity, actually. I, mean, yeah, I, yeah. I echo those words too for, with that, Ali. I think I need to start looking at myself first as I t continue with this current assignment. And it starts with me and not to prejudge or judge. It's, it's, uh, it starts with me first and yeah. finding out the why. I think that's yeah. the why. Thank and you. One, yeah, and one thing I would say at the end, because this is also, I, I, I had it this summer. Uh, before I lost my job, I have always afraid of losing the job. Actually, that's a funny thing. And suddenly uh, I lost it. And I found that, okay, even if I uh, was sticking to my job, it happened. And uh, it's uh, funny if I tell you that even when I jumped to the next job, which I started from 1st of September, I already noticed that I'm going to lose this one as well. But now I'm not afraid of that anymore because uh, yeah, this, this is when it's happening a lot, then you see that, okay, you are still alive and you didn't lose anything. It's just a matter of opportunity. You can turn it to the opportunity and now, at the, in the first time of my life, I'm just thinking, okay, what kind of job I like? Let's forget mm -hmm. about the losing. How you are Let's... harvesting from the upset? You're harvesting big time. Yes, yes. Big time. 
Yeah, that's all I just wanted to tell you. I, this is uh, really working for me. It happened on, on fo it forced me to do it, but I already experienced it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Diane, do you have anything you want to share here? Um, I, I just feel we need more conversations such as these um, that are very heart centered and share stories um, and where we can share our own personal experiences. I, I think it's very, very valuable and I'm very grateful to all of you. And I'm particularly grateful to you, Karen. And uh, your book is called Heart Revolution. The Heart Revolution, transform your life, transform your business. Exactly. <laughs> and I, uh, where can people get the book? Is it online? Yes, it's so it's on Amazon and it's on, you can also visit me on karentobiasen.com or my company breathingbusiness.com. And he, there are many, many, many more stories. Right, and you've certainly breathed some life into all of us today, that's for sure. <laughs> Karen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say that even though we were in this uh, Zoom room, uh, we, I could feel your soul and your heart. And I think all of us felt that. And everyone else on the call, thank you so much. It's been incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Farah. Bye. 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 Bye.